Crunchyroll original is perhaps one of the most tainted phrases in the entire English language. Sure, folks have their issues with Netflix original anime too, but at least for every record of Ragnarok, we've gotten a Devilman Crybaby or Violet Evergarden. When it comes to Crunchyroll's offerings, all there seem to be are duds no one's heard of, disasters everyone's heard of, disappointing wastes of potential, and Tony Kawa, which some people argue shouldn't even count as a Crunchyroll original because it's only a co-production, even though that would also disqualify Jibby 8 and X-Arm and thus actually would be a huge net win for the brand. It's kind of a pointless pedantic argument either way though, and there's a lot of those surrounding this topic on account of all the culture war trenches that have been dug in all around it, everywhere. Which I am gonna try my hardest not to trip into, because that shit is just plain exhausting. I started this channel because I love watching, talking about, analyzing, and poking fun at anime and sometimes games, but it's difficult to engage in or even reliably find honest, thorough criticism of any piece of media in a landscape where Every piece of media can suddenly become a hill that terminally online weirdos are just dying to die on. So, now that the Crunchyroll Originals brand is pretty well dead itself, with only two unreleased shows left on the roadmap and no more announcements in sight, I want to try to separate the 14 shows they've made so far from all that stigma, judge them purely by their own merits, or at least the merits of their first three episodes, and see just how well they really deserve their terrible reputation as individual works and as a whole, specifically by rating them on a scale from 1 to 10 and then averaging out those scores. Now, Crunchyroll has sponsored me in the past, and I'm presently working on an 86 video with them, which is why that's taken so long to come out, so I understand that some of you may just not trust me to make that assessment. However, I would point out that Crunchyroll Originals have taken the top slot in my worst anime of the year list for two years running now, and presently, Freak Angels is poised to make that a hat trick. I promise I am not going into this with kid gloves on. I am, however, going in with my new official custom hidden G Fuel Village headband on, and with their brand new Naruto Shippuden Sage Mode formula in my body, so that I don't fall asleep while watching some of these. You may not have the same need for this product, but nonetheless you need it, for it is a collectible with Naruto's face on the box. It compels your otaku cells to buy it. And if you want to get 30% off it and anything else at gfuel.com, all you have to do is use the promo code BASEMENT when you check out. Now, add stop no jutsu. Since we're already on the subject of so-called original co-productions, I think it makes sense to start our rundown of these anime there even if the subject of Crunchyroll original co-productions in itself doesn't make a lick of sense. You might not be aware of this, but Crunchyroll has been funding anime from the production committee side of things since long before originals were a thing back in 2017. Actually, they started back in 2015, but it took two years for any of those shows to come out because the entire anime industry is stretched beyond capacity right now, and that's how far in advance you need to book an anime studio to get a show made. Remember that, it'll come up later. This initiative has produced a fair number of bad anime, including The Master of Ragnarok and Blesser of Einherjar, but it's also given us a lot of widely loved anime, like Yorimoi, Yuru Camp, Kimono Friends, and the Kino's Journey reboot. And the only reason that none of those were branded as Crunchyroll originals is that the brand didn't exist, or at least they weren't ready to go public with it at the time they came out. If they had been, if this color-coded D&D party had been the first face of the label instead of that other one, we'd probably be having a very different conversation right now. And on the flip side, the conversation could be evolving right now if they hadn't decided to stop branding all of their co-productions as originals just in time to miss the boat on Odd Taxi. Though the discussion around originals is so toxic at this point that it was probably a good idea to keep that distance, it most likely would have just hurt Odd Taxi's brand. The point I'm trying to make here is that which co-productions end up counting as Crunchyroll originals is an entirely arbitrary matter of timing and marketing whims. And if you think about it that way, 
it's actually a pretty fucking wild coincidence that two shows as historically awful as X-Arm and Jibby 8 both ended up making the cut. I'm not going to spend too much time on either one, since I already gave them their dressing down on the worst of the year lists, but I do want to impress upon you, if you haven't seen the shows or those videos, just how fucking bad they really are. Jibby 8, whose plot plays like a bad Onimusha Resident Evil crossover fanfic, was written and produced by a guy who has zero experience writing or producing anime. And so, even though he was collaborating with the likes of Yoshitaka Amano, game composer Yuzo Koshiro, and Shamisen Megastars the Yoshida Brothers, his inept management and even worse script writing utterly squandered all of their efforts. And if you think that's bad, wait till you hear that X-Arm's entire team was people who've never made anime before, with a live-action TV director heading up the first-ever animation effort from, I'm not kidding here, a company that previously made environment assets for FromSoft games, resulting in a TV show that looks more like a Steam Greenlight trailer. Jibby 8 is one of the worst original anime I've ever watched in my life, and X-Arm might just be the worst anime ever made, period. It's definitely the most butchered adaptation by a wide margin. Berserk 2016 ain't got shit. Zero out of ten to the both of them. But what about the other shows that got arbitrarily lumped? in with them. Well, the dungeon survival isekai So I'm a Spider So What was pretty great, until the production fell apart halfway through the season. It probably would have benefited from getting the whole split core treatment, like it's winter contemporary Mushoku Tensei, instead of burning the whole staff out on a straight 23 episode run, only to have episode 24 delayed into July anyway, but that's just a depressingly common problem across the entire anime industry. That said, the show's writing and voice acting do hold up, and the experience of watching a lone gamer laboriously grind and min-max the low-level dungeon mob she reincarnated into while trying not to get eaten by a mini-boss is unique and exciting enough by itself to make the series worth a watch. Even if that story does get a little bit majorly bogged down by frequent half-episode-long cutaways to the heroine's classmates doing far more boring Dragon Quest-type generic isekai shit, a new addition to the anime that wasn't present in the light novels, and uh, doesn't add much to it. Look, if your protag's not gonna rock up with a rocket launcher to kill all the monsters, make the popular kid look like a chump, and cuck his bully, Ari Ferretta style, it's just not worth wasting time on that sort of side content. On that note, if you missed it, because the cowards at YouTube age restricted it, I just dropped a roast of Ari Ferretta, which is probably the funniest thing I've ever made, so go watch that when you're done with this, or if you get bored with it halfway through. Anywho, despite those shortcomings, So I'm a Spider So What gets 7 out of 10 for its tense plot and intense monster-on-boss-monster -monster action. Speaking of monster fights, Inspector is a romantic supernatural mystery series about Kotoko Iwanaga, a girl who traded an eye and a leg for the power to mediate disputes between humans and yokai, and Kuro Sakuragawa, a handsome fella she happened to meet at the hospital, and on whom she immediately pounced the second his long-term girlfriend broke up with him, who also may or may not have mysterious supernatural powers of his own. If I'd only three episode tested this series, I'd probably have given it an eight or even a nine for its remarkable sense of atmosphere and consistently high production values. Unfortunately for Inspector, I watched enough of it when it came out to see it drop off hard and then drop it as those first three episodes full of fun Monster of the Week shenanigans gave way to a season-long story arc about Steel Lady Nanase, an evil idol ghost with these hefty, honking, biceps that she uses to carry around this eye beam and bludgeon people to death. Also, she has these absolutely massive tracks of exposition associated with her, which go on and on for most of the show's runtime after she shows up and really drag it down. Also, also, her boobies are very big, but it's hard to appreciate that or any of the interesting high concepts surrounding her when everything involving her is so damn slow and boring, 5 out of 10.
For those who like their supernatural mysteries a wee bit stranger than that, you might really enjoy Dr. Ramune, Mysterious Disease Specialist, a show about a selfish, lazy doctor who probably won't do much for your cough or sniffles, but if you've found yourself suddenly crying mayonnaise or with your weenus having mysteriously turned into a fish cake, he might just have a prescription for one ironic, supernatural life lesson with your name on it. This definitely is not an anime for everyone, but if you're one of those rare few cultured fans of Laughing Salesman and Gegege no Kitaro, I could see it becoming one of your all-time faves. Dr. Ramane also features some unusually complicated lore and surprisingly deep dynamic characters for this kind of show, so if you were just expecting an episodic dark comedy without much continuity, think again. Also, I should note that one of those characters is a 112-year-old grandma who looks like a grade schooler. <laughs> Luckily, not that kind. In fact, the first thing we see Akane do in the entire show is beat the shit out of a gross pedophile for fun. It's a pretty great twist on that particular trope, and it seems like there's a lot of those here. Dr. Ramane is clever, witty, and creative, the ideal surreal comedy package, and I give the first three episodes an 8 out of 10. Last, and definitely not least, of the co-production originals is Tony Kawa, Over the Moon for You, a romantic comedy about a brilliant, driven student named Nasa who spies a beautiful girl across the road on one crisp, moonlit night, falls in love at first sight, and then gets hit by a truck about three seconds after that because he didn't look both ways before going to pick her up. Luckily, the girl, Sukasa, has some sort of supernatural something going on with her, so she's able to dive in and save him, and after he gives a heartfelt spur-of-the-moment confession, she even agrees to marry him, then disappears on his ass for several years. But when she comes back, true to her word, they tie the knot the very next day, and the show follows them from that point forward as they build their new life together and get to know each other along with all the friends and neighbors around them and also Tsukasa's weird, super-rich family, and don't think we forgot about that superhero shit she pulled when her future mans was about to get isekai'd. There's some plot here. Not too much, though. Mostly, Tony Kawa's just a relaxing, slice-of-life comedy full of doki-doki moments of romance and plenty of hearty laughs. There's a reason this is the one Crunchyroll original that even the hardest core haters won't hate on. 8 out of 10. Which brings the average score for these co-production originals to 4.6 out of 10. As you'd expect of what is effectively a random selection of anime, it's a mixed bag of nuts, uh, give or take a couple rat turds. So how does that compare to Crunchyroll's more deliberate original anime programming? Namely, the series of collaborations they've done with Webtoon and Adult Swim. I think it's safe to say that the Webtoon collabs, God of High School, Tower of God, and Noblesse, generated the most positive buzz for Crunchyroll originals out of anything they put out, at least ahead of their release. A lot of people love them, some Korean-style tall webcomics, and Manwa has long been deserving of a bigger place in the cultural conversation, so these shows were, in a very real sense, game-changers for anime. People were understandably hyped. But when people get hyped for something, and then it doesn't really live up to that hype, those feelings can really sour really fast, and unfortunately, only one of those shows, Tower of God, gave Webtoon fans anywhere near what they were hoping for. Mostly that's an issue of pacing. While they're all fairly impressive in terms of their Sakuga fight choreography and overall production values, all three adaptations feel, to some extent or another, rushed. As I said, Tower of God, which has been called by some the One Piece of Webtoons, suffers the least in this regard, as it's only been sped up just enough to reach a comfortable end point to its first major story arc in 12 episodes. It still hits a lot of important world and character building beats along the way to that goal, and each of the tests our heroes are faced with as they climb the tower that is their entire planet is given enough breathing room to be tense and satisfying as its own little story. The show also features some seriously incredible action scenes, enhanced by a beautiful art style that's designed with fluid, sharp motion in mind, and underscored by the always memorable music of Kevin Penkin. Tower of God is just a darn good anime, a true treat for all the senses, and not a half-bad story on top of that. 
easy 8 out of 10. Sadly, only the first half of that last sentence describes the god of high school. In the hands of Jujutsu Kaisen's Song Hu Park, the fights that make up the show's titular teen martial arts tournament are breathtaking, with thrilling, dynamic camera work and snappy, hard-hitting character movements that sync perfectly with Alisa Okehazama's jam-slapping, genre-blending soundtrack, just like the fights in Jujutsu Kaisen do. However, outside of those scenes, the rest of the show pretty much may as well not be there. The problem is this anime is just laser focused on covering as much of the tournament as possible in 12 episodes and absolutely nothing else. Every other part of the plot just gets cut down to a Cliff's Notes version of itself to make room for more fights. One character goes from being single to having an arranged marriage and hating it, to being okay with the guy actually, to backing out of it in the space of a single episode. High on God School's pacing feels like you know that gif of baby Deku rocking back and forth in the chair? Imagine that you're on a bullet train and he's holding the throttle. This anime gave me physical whiplash. Four out of ten. That just leaves us with No Bless, a show about a handsome, noble vampire boy fighting evil with his various demi-human associates while also attending a high school, which, to be honest, even after watching three episodes, I still don't really get. Part of that's because apparently the TV team at Production IG decided to just start the TV series right after the OVA they'd already made, meaning that if you watch the show, you end up missing all the setup that should have been in episode one. But also, again, the pacing is just off. Not necessarily rushed in this case, but just not well put together. The show pivots between light character comedy, tense, serious drama, and heavy action on a dime without doing anything to smooth the transition. Each episode feels less like a coherent, self-contained plot made of interwoven scenes and more like, well, a handful of webcomic chapters stapled together without any transitions. It's not an unpleasant viewing experience, the jokes can be funny and a few of the fights go pretty hard, it just never comes together into anything greater than the sum of its very uneven parts. 6 out of 10, which sets the average for Webtoon Originals at 6 out of 10. Not bad, but for a trio of shows meant to change the face of anime, not nearly enough. As for the Adult Swim collabs, the reason they exist is self-explanatory if you know anything about the business side of Crunchyroll, a former subsidiary of Otter Media, a subsidiary of Warner Media, a subsidiary of AT&T. As well, of course, as the business side of Adult Swim, a mature programming block on Cartoon Network, a division of the kids, young adults, and classic division of Warner Brothers Entertainment, a subsidiary of Warner Media, a subsidiary of AT&T. Before the anime streaming boom, Adult Swim and Toonami on Cartoon Network were the places where Americans with an interest in anime developed an actual taste in anime, which inevitably led them to looking for the harder stuff online. On top of that, the teams at Cartoon Network were commissioning original content from anime studios long before originals were even a thing, so having them partner with Crunchyroll to develop another new IP, plus two big ticket adaptations, just made sense. One of those adaptations, Shenmue, is coming out possibly the day I publish this video, so, uh, I don't know if it's good or bad, you'll have to tell me in the comments, but I will say that trailer looked pretty dope, and just on the grounds that you don't have to actually play it, if it lives up to that, it's got a pretty good shot at being the best Shenmue thing by default. Their other big-ticket legacy IP show, Blade Runner Black Lotus, follows up on the 2017 Shinichiro Watanabe-directed ONA, Blade Runner Blackout 22, this time with Watanabe in the producer's chair as 3D anime-directing duo Shinji Aramaki and Kenji Kamiyama of Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex, Star Wars The Ninth Jedi, and Metabots fame, taking the reins. I know a lot of you out there have a very strong distaste for 3D CG anime of all kinds, and Aramaki and Kamiyama's shows don't always do the best job of dispelling that stigma with their at times clumsy motion capture, but they always at least feature sharp, interesting cinematography and editing, and pretty great fight scenes across the board that do things that just aren't possible in 2D. And while all of the human models in Blade Runner Black Lotus are as rough and awkward as the characters in any of their shows, the modeling and shading of the props and backgrounds is just 
spot on to the production design of the film. From Voigt Kampf machines to billboard geisha to the little architectural embellishments, this is unmistakably Blade Runner's LA. What's not quite as on brand is the story, which follows a badass mechanical lady as she kung fu fights her way through an identity crisis and I mean, you heard what I just said. It's pretty much just Ghost in the Shell, but in Blade Runner. It's not a particularly well-told story either, at least not in the first three episodes, but with one of the actual Ghost in the Shell guys directing it, that mix of two iconic cyberpunk vibes does at least work surprisingly well, and if you're a hardcore enough cyberpunk fanboy to want to see that, but not hardcore enough that you would care about all of the lore problems it creates, you probably have a good time with it. Six out of ten. On the subject of pretty, capable ladies discovering who they are while also kicking some ass, Fena, Pirate Princess, is that new IP from Production IG that I mentioned they were making. In telling its tale of high seas adventure, starring a boisterous orphan girl with a mysterious destiny and her retinue of steampunk ninja pirate bodyguards, Fena does a great many things right. It is a stunningly gorgeous anime with consistently impressive action and animation, fantastic music, and a rare, impeccably crafted atmosphere that could give the best pirate fantasies out there a run for their money. For 10 episodes straight, it delivered a darn near perfect feeling of adventure that made it impossible for me to put down. Sadly, it is 12 episodes long, and those last two? I won't spoil things for you, but Let's just say that the answer to what Fena's destiny is, is some cliche-ass bullshit that completely robs her of her agency as a character while trying to pretend that the core theme of the story is choice, then slaps you directly in the face for ever being stupid enough to get invested in her arc. With a better finale, this could have been a 9, maybe 10 out of 10 anime, but that ending is... so bad. The best I can do is a 6. Still worth watching, just maybe not worth finishing. That leaves just one final category, by far the most contentious one, the native English dubbed Crunchyroll originals, High Guardian Spice, Onyx Equinox, and Freak Angels. Some might call them the ones that aren't anime, but since Freak Angels was produced in Japan by a mostly Japanese creative staff, it doesn't really fit that label no matter which definition of anime you use, though I'm pretty sure Onyx Equinox was actually recorded in Spanish before English, so my label's not perfect either, but it does at least highlight the one major problem that all of these series share, that because they didn't need the subtitles for translation purposes, Crunchyroll just didn't bother subbing these shows at all. And that's not just a problem for their deaf and neurodivergent viewers, because the audio mixing of those dubs just so happens to be completely atrocious. I mean, borderline unintelligible in places. I am Slime Boy. You're... You're what now? That's what everyone calls me. I kind of like that. Uh, you know, it's the same slime and then boy. And I guess that brings us to the most infamous of these series, High Guardian Spice. This was, of course, the first original that Crunchyroll ever announced, the bean-mouthed face of the entire brand, which was perhaps not the most calculated marketing move they could have made toward a fan base that's partly defined by its aversion to Western-style cartoons specifically, but would probably have gone over a lot better if there was any footage of the show to, you know, show. Instead, we got a short montage of interview clips that seemed precision designed to specifically piss off the anti-SJW crowd without actually providing the opposite side of that with any good ammo to defend it. It was kind of the perfect PR shitstorm, and that left Crunchyroll management feeling uneasy about publishing or even promoting the show anymore. So even though it was purportedly finished and ready to go out in 2019, we saw nothing more of it till last year, at which point it was just too late. Almost no one but the haters cared anymore, and on release it was immediately received, as in so immediately that it hadn't been out for as many hours as it was long before people started putting in one-star reviews, as one of the worst affronts to the concept of visual storytelling in the history of history. Which normally would excite me. I am, after all, a trash connoisseur and lover of hate watches. I do enjoy a good train wreck. But I had a sneaking suspicion there was some confirmation bias at play there, as 
often happens when a thing is hated for what it represents. And sure enough, when I watched it myself, it was just kind of mid. Sure, it's an extremely cheap show with an animation style that, due to how it's implemented, comes off less as simple shapes allow for lots of dynamic motion and more if every frame looks equally sloppy, that's technically an aesthetic. And sure, the world building's flimsy, the main characters have fairly flat personalities, and the episode plots all feel contrived and cobbled together. But to put this merely mediocre pretender in the same trash fire pantheon as X-Arm, Jibiate, Master of Ragnarok, and Handshakers? That's just blasphemy, my friend. To be clear, I would rather watch any of those shows than this one. I mean, I finished all of them for their respective roasts, whereas High Guardian Spice is going to stay dropped at three episodes until the day I die. But that's only because I'm a freak who prefers being confused, angry, and or frightened by the media I watch to just plain bored. And High Guardian Spice is just plain boring. Four out of ten. That's not to say there are no good reasons to be apprehensive about it, though. I don't agree with the most frequently stated complaint about the series, that an anime streaming company should just never, ever fund Western animation. The industry is, as I said at the top of the video, extremely overburdened at the moment, so pushing crap like Jibby 8 through the pipeline can potentially hurt other anime by taking away freelance animators from their production, whereas High Guardian Spice exists in its own bubble. No, my issue with the series is that Crunchyroll tried to fund it specifically like an anime, with a budget that the creator equated to what Cartoon Network would typically spend on an 11-minute episode of one of their shows, or, to put it another way, less than half of what is typically needed to make a good 24-minute episode. Which not only puts some of its failings in perspective, but also frames its failure as kind of a good thing overall, at least for American animators who I presume would not want to see a precedent set to underpay them even harder for even harder work. Putting that huge issue aside, while High Guardian Spice definitely is not the show for me, I can see a hypothetical teenager who really loves Steven Universe using it to scratch that particular itch. If they've already seen all of Adventure Time, and Amphibia, and Owl House, and Little Witch Academia, and Infinity Train, and Hilda, and Ray Earth, and Bravest Warriors, and Star vs. the Forces of Evil, and Kipo and the Age of Wonder Beasts, and She-Ra, and Gravity Falls, and The Dragon Prince, and My Little Pony, and Sailor Moon, and every other Kunihiku Ikahara anime. But... Even if I just described you, I do think that there are much better uses for your limited time on this earth. And frankly, that goes double for the haters. I'm sorry, but if you're a contributor to the terrible TV shows wiki and you're reaching for a burn like, quote, Rosemary, Sage, Thyme, and Parsley are named after herbs, grasses in Latin, which are not spices, maybe it's time to move on to richer material. Might I suggest... What is it about the apocalypse apparently that makes me so damn thirsty? Christ, what if I'm a puckle pregnant? How fucking cliche. The concept of psychic superhuman Whitechapel chavs vying for dominance over an apocalyptically flooded England sounds pretty cool. And hell, sunken post-apocalyptic diesel punk London even looks pretty cool from a distance if you squint. But when said psychic superhumans talk like what you just heard and band together under a group name that sounds more like a Chris Angel fan club than a psychic super street gang, it feels like we're falling a mite short of that concept's full potential. Freak Angels, capital F, capital A, all one word, adapted from a webcomic of the same name by artist Paul Duffield and prolific comic writer Warren Ellis, was one of the first originals Crunchyroll announced with their big trailer back in February 2020. But then, in June of 2020, we got the surprise announcement that Warren Ellis is also a prolific sex pest, Netflix fired his ass from Castlevania immediately, and and Crunchyroll just stopped talking about this show for two entire years before quietly sharding it out at the end of this January. Even without the scandal, though, I can see why they wouldn't want to call attention to this one. It is bad. The line art makes all of the characters look like Paper Jam Dipper half the time. They fit about as seamlessly into those 3D backgrounds as the roadside audiences of Initial D Season 1. The plot just 
ping pongs randomly between seemingly disconnected story beats, and the dialogue is, as you just heard, so fucking atrocious that not even the tried and true Warren Ellis method of inserting fucking swear words randomly into every shitball sentence can disguise its many shortcomings. Fuck. I am really looking forward to fully dressing this one down come January. The show does at least have some very nice background art and quite ambitious storyboarding. You can tell the animators wanted to have some fun with it, but as is all too common within the human condition, it turns out they wanted what they could couldn't have. One out of ten. The last of the originals we have left to talk about is Onyx Equinox, and since I spent so much time dunking on the other two, I'll just cut to the chase. It's pretty good. It was animated by the same team as High Guardian Spice, and you can tell they learned a lot from their missteps on that show. The more anime-esque art style fits the limited animation techniques they're using better, and the creature designs, especially with their harsh, contrasting bodies, look really good even at low frame rates. More importantly, its story, a fantasy adventure with deep roots in Aztec history and culture about a meek young man chosen by his cruel gods to save the world, is pretty goddamn metal. Like, imagine Avatar, but instead of Appa, Aang is accompanied by a vicious, man-eating panther who hurls constant verbal abuse at him. Also, he has no special skills whatsoever and almost gets murdered every episode, while a lot of other people do get murdered all around him all the time. If you like apocalyptic dark fantasy with blood magic and shit, this is an edgy good time. I suppose I should disclose that I'm also just a sucker for Mesoamerican fantasy aesthetics in general. Shell isn't the only part of Road to El Dorado that's stuck in my brain forever, so I am a bit biased in this show's favor. Maya of the Three on Netflix is way better, especially in the visual department, but Onyx Equinox is still a solid 7 out of 10 in a severely underserved niche. That sets the average for non-Japanese originals at 4 out of 10 on the dot. And the grand total average for the whole Crunchyroll Originals project, minus the two that aren't out yet, is 4.4 out of 10. Not a great showing, or even a good one really. Five out of the 14 shows do sit around the high end of good, low end of great, but a lot more of them range from meh to bleh, and, of course, two of them are quite possibly the worst anime ever made, so that skews the score down a bit more. If you took those out of the equation, it'd be a barely passing 5.1, but then you'd also have to take out Tony Kawa, so actually 4.8. That's... close to not failing, though. Original series should be something to get excited about. In the growth-obsessed stage of capitalism we're currently at, basically all commercial art needs to serve as an onboarding platform for further merchandising and or monetization opportunities to justify its initial investment. Just look at how every other third-party AAA video game these days has live-service bullshit baked into it. Assuming there still are third-party video games in the far future of two days from now. On the flip side of that, console exclusives from Bloodborne to Breath of the Wild tend to be more self-contained, finished, high-quality experiences that you can enjoy fully out of the box. And they can be that because instead of just selling themselves and some microtransactions, these games exist to sell the very platforms they're on. There's an economic incentive for the platform makers to give the devs enough resources to actually make them good so that people will buy more PlayStations eventually when the crypto market collapses and we have chips again. By the same token, good original content sells streaming subscriptions, and thus, in theory, streaming originals should be of higher average quality than standard license acquisitions. And the fact that Crunchyroll's originals are so far the opposite of that speaks, in my ears at least, to a lack of vision and confidence in the project behind the scenes. Which is, I think, what really killed it after that initial backlash maimed it. That's just my take on these shows, though, and I'd love to hear yours in the comments below, especially since I couldn't finish all of them. Did I miss the mark on a show that gets great later, or dodge a bullet with something that goes downhill fast after episode 3? And most importantly, did you remember to drink your G Fuel? I'm Jeff Thu, Apocal Professional G Fuel Dealer, signing out from my Apocal apartment, which is kind of like a regular apartment, just with s slightly less wall.